here I sit pondering things and how they're going in this course that I'm teaching in the summer about halfway through, but students by and large have not submitted half the assignments. I'm just wondering what I can do to kind of encourage movement in that direction. Let me show you something I just found that came to me through an email. All right, some nice people at a place called Faculty Focus sent me a report. And look at what this thing is entitled. 11 Strategies for Getting Students to Read What's Assigned. My, my, isn't this an interesting thing? So I thank these people from Faculty Focus, the teaching professor, Magna Publication, for sending me this. Now, let's just take a close look at something they indicate here in the very first page. I'm going to increase the size of this a bit so you can see it better. And then I'm also going to highlight some of these words. Aha! First of all, getting students to take their reading assignments seriously is a constant battle. How well we know this. We cajole, we don't really offer death threats, but we give firmly stated admonitions that you must do the reading. Aha! And here though, despite the correlation between reading and course success, many students remain committed to trying to get by without doing the reading or doing it very superficially or doing it just before exam dates. Now I've fallen into this next trap. Some instructors fall into the trap of using valuable class time to summarize key points of the readings. Well, I'm teaching online now. I have given recorded lectures that do summarize some key elements of the readings. However, when I look at the numbers of uh, views of those videos, they don't actually match the number of students in the class. Hmm, isn't that a problem? Well, here's another informative statement. It's not a new problem, and we can't simply bemoan the fact that students don't read. And what we've been doing, threats, endless quizzes, chapter summaries, has failed to solve the problem. But now here is a key statement, and let me highlight this for you. The better solution involves designing courses so that students can't do well without reading and creating assignments that require students to do more than just passively read. Well now, I've done some other research and I find that people learn things best. Research has proven this now, that people learn things best when they're given something tough to do and it requires them to go back in and dig out the answers. Hmm, does that sound like exercises as I've designed them? Well, I wonder. Other research also indicates that students who do this and see their scores rise have a great deal of satisfaction from the effort. And another piece of research indicates that students are more satisfied when they receive quick feedback as opposed to delayed feedback. Delayed feedback is what you get when you turn in a homework assignment and a week or two later you get it back graded with some notes in the margin indicating what you misunderstood. There you don't get a chance to do it again and the feedback may come so late after the fact that you started to forget what was involved in any case. Ah, but immediately graded exercises of the right variety do give you feedback right away. Isn't that an interesting proposition? And as the score that you get rises, it would seem that that other piece of research uh, bears out the fact that seeing your grade rise with your efforts leads to satisfaction also. Now, I will give you a hint. In the type of exercise that I use, which consists of only five questions, but each question having ten true-false statements, I would suggest that you understand that most of the statements are true because it's my contention that as you read through those statements repeatedly that you'll probably remember them and I would rather have you remember accurate statements and true statements rather than false ones. However, the ones that I've made false are generally done not in a trick way but in a subtle way. The subtle way is I try to find the things that if you hadn't done the reading you would naturally assume were true. Cases where those assumptions really aren't borne out and the reading indicates why they're not borne out. There's a few, up to a few.
incorrect statements in every group of 10. Now I have two ways of implementing those exercises. One way is to make the questions all or nothing. No partial credit. You either get all 10 of the true-false statements marked correctly in a question, in which case you get 10 points for the question, which is full credit. If you mark even one statement true and it isn't, or false and it isn't, then you don't get any credit for the question. Now that's my preferred way of doing it. However, the system I'm using right now to implement these things makes me give partial credit. So with the existing implementation for which I've used Moodle, Moodle seems to, at least at my understanding and all the investigation I've done, force me to spread the credit for the question across the correct answers. Now that's the reason that the partial credit varies from question to question. The partial credit will be different depending on whether I have one, two, three, four, or some other number of false statements. Now I don't think it's particularly good to give partial credit because I don't want to encourage students to settle for a mediocre grade by piddling around in these questions and guessing as to the correct answers. So I may in the future figure out a way to make all the questions all or nothing, even using Moodle. However, I do have another system accessible and if I implemented things on that, then definitely I would have that capability. Well, be that as it may, the statements under each question are randomized in terms of sequence every time you take one of these exercises. And I think that's a very good thing. However, I don't randomize the sequence of the questions themselves because I think that would be going just a bit too far. I suggest you work through the questions one question at a time. Focus on one question and take some notes as you answer things and then see the score that you get just for that one question. When you've perfected your knowledge of the one question, keep those notes and move on to another question. If you do this, you'll build up notes for correct answers to all five of the questions. And then you can take the exercise a final time and use those notes to score a perfect score on the entire exercise. Now, in some versions of courses, I give students the entire course up until five minutes before the final exam to do the exercises and the final exam in that case is based on the very same content. So by performing on the exercises you not only are boosting your grade since those exercises count for half your grade, by doing those exercises you're also reviewing for the final exam. However in courses where I don't give a final exam I limit the availability of the exercises to each two-week unit. You do have the two-week unit to work on the exercise but after the two-week unit ends, that particular exercise becomes inaccessible. Because in that case, I want to focus your attention on completing the work within the unit and doing as well as you can within that unit before we move on to a new topic. So that's just a little bit of information from me to you. Hopefully that will convince you of the wisdom of my using these exercises and the benefit to you of performing well on them as the course progresses. In courses where you have the entire course time up until five minutes before the online final to work on the exercises, it's a huge mistake to put off working on those exercises because those exercises are based on the content of each individual unit and it really serves you well to know that content within the unit in order to complete the other assignments I give you within the units. You should do that and then plan on reviewing the exercises before the final exam. That I think would be the best strategy for you. With that advice I'll sign off and I hope this has been informative to you.